I want to talk also now about sleep disordered breathing and fibromyalgia. Uh, obstructive sleep apnea occurs when the upper airway uh, collapses from the relaxation of muscles. It's specifically the genioglossus muscle, the tongue, in the back of the throat. When it collapses, you can see on the right that air is not able to enter the airway. When air doesn't enter the airway, lungs can't make oxygen, and uh, that's bad because oxygen is a good thing to have around most of the time. That much we, we are pretty sure about. So this is a condition that we're always on the lookout for because of its very significant uh, physical consequences. Uh, next slide, please. So now that we're experts in sleep studies, we can see in this particular slide that up at the top, the person isn't getting any deep sleep or REM sleep, and that in the third box down, their oxygen is driving down very low, down into the 70 percentile range. And then after in the very bottom, when they put the patient on CPAP, all their problems miraculously go away. So this is what we're trying to do. Uh, when, we, when, we're, when we identify patients with sleep apnea and treat them. There's new data coming out that sleep apnea appears to be 10 times more common in people with fibromyalgia compared to the non-fibromyalgia population. Uh, this is not well understood. Uh, however, it's, it's becoming more apparent that we need to uh, perform sleep studies on patients with fibromyalgia. Uh, not only to look at the alpha delta intrusion, uh, but restless legs, periodic leg movements, as well as obstructive sleep apnea, which is ten tenfold more common. Next slide, please. So what's happening in sleep apnea is uh, at the top, the airway collapses, oxygen goes down, carbon dioxide goes up, there's a fight or flight response with increased cortisol, increased heart rate, increased blood pressure, increased mental activity, which then uh, causes an arousal, your airway opens, uh, your oxygen restores back to normal, you fall back to sleep, your airway collapses, your oxygen drops, your fire or flight kicks in. So this vicious cycle can occur many times an hour, sometimes 80 to 100 times an hour, and this goes on throughout the night. And this is what puts stress on the body. Uh, sleep apnea has now been associated with high blood pressure, reflux, glaucoma, diabetes, stroke, heart attack, uh, pulmonary hypertension, uh, to name a few. Next slide. In terms of therapy, about 80% of people who have sleep apnea uh, are recommended to use CPAP, which stands for Continuous Positive Airway Pressure. Now, CPAP is not oxygen, it's just air that's been pressurized, which then creates a sort of pneumatic stent, keeping the airway open, so when you breathe, air does enter the body. Now in the past, the mask used to be much more uncomfortable, much more claustrophobic. Uh, we would refer to them as the Darth Vader mask a lot of times, uh, but the machines are much quieter uh, and, the, and the apparatus are much more comfortable. And, by, and, and because of that, patients are much more compliant and we're getting much better, much better results. Next slide, please. Besides CPAP, there's a number of other therapies, including uh, the oral appliance therapy, which can see, uh, you can see above. This is actually FDA approved for people who have mild and moderate sleep apnea. Uh, they are made by dentists, uh, so sometimes they can be pricey, and it will be difficult for some of these to get approved uh, by the insurance companies, but it is FDA approved for mild and moderate sleep apnea. And it works by advancing the bottom jaw or mandible so it prevents its collapse and it can be very successful. Certain people have positional sleep apnea. In other words, they, their apnea is worse when they're on their back, but it can sometimes go away when they're on their side. In those cases, I like to use a positional pillow like the Sona pillow, which is shown below. This is designed to keep people on their side and prevent them from rolling over their back, and this can be very successful as well. Next slide. I'm going to be a principal investigator in a new device, which is called the uh, hypoglossal nerve stimulator. Uh, and this is basically a pacemaker that's going to be implanted in the chest wall with a wire that runs up into the hypoglossal nerve, stimulating that genioglossus muscle. So at night, you would basically turn on this pacemaker, and it would open up your airway. And then in the morning, when you wake up, uh, you would turn it off. This is an experimental 
approach. We're just going to be starting the phase two trials this summer, so hopefully uh, by, uh, by uh, next year we should have some uh, results to share with you. Next slide, please. I'm going to talk a little bit about restless legs. Um, this was a very, very old syndrome first described in the 1600s by Sir John Willis and called night crawler syndrome. Uh, there was a, an explosion of uh, research by Dr. Ekbaum in the 50s here in the United States uh, where he predicted that it was probably going to be present in about 5 to 15 percent of the population and he correlated it with iron deficiency and he was right in all these regards. Next slide, please. And we can click a few to, to uh, make the points appear. Uh, but restless legs is a clinical <coughs> syndrome, and it's not made with a sleep study. Uh, this diagnosis is made by the patient's complaints. And the four complaints I, I refer to as urge. There's an urge to move the legs associated with an unpleasant sensation, a worsening of symptoms with rest, an improvement of symptoms with movement or getting up, and that the symptoms tend to Im increase in the evening and night. Next slide, please. Restless legs is associated with iron deficiency as well as thyroid disease, and we need to test for those conditions in everyone who presents with restless legs. Uh, it can be a manifestation of peripheral neuropathy as well as lumbar radiculopathy, which is a pinched nerve in the back. Um, it sometimes is associated with uh, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, but this may more be a restlessness in general, not restless legs per se. And fibromyalgia, it is probably present in 30 to 40 percent of the population. It can be worsened by antihistamines such as Benadryl. It can be worsened by certain tricyclic antidepressants such as Elevil and Panelor, otherwise known as amitriptyline and nortriptyline, which are very commonly used in fibromyalgia. Uh, SSRIs, which are the uh, serotonin-specific reuptake inhibitors, antidepressants, Zoloft and Paxil, can sometimes worsen this. And dopamine agonists, such as Seroquel and Zyprexil, uh, Zyprexa, which are powerful antipsychotics we use for very severe insomnia patients, uh, can, uh, this can be, it very much exacerbate restless legs. Next slide, please. So how do we treat restless legs? Well, benzodiazepines such as clonopin can be very successful. Certain anti-epileptic drugs such as Depakote and Topamax. Uh, narcotics uh, such as Vicodin. Dopa agonists are FDA approved including Mirapex and Requip and most uh, patients are on those. Quinine can be beneficial in some patients. Uh, the FDA uh, saw fit to eliminate a inexpensive uh, and very helpful medication um, but it's still available in tonic water. Uh, magnesium is an over-the-counter supplement that can sometimes be very helpful. And again, iron replacement can be uh, very helpful, especially if iron and ferritin levels are shown to be low. Next slide, please. So we're going to move on and talk about narcolepsy. Uh, narcolepsy is, a, is a, a rare condition, but it also is probably uh, overrepresented in the fibromyalgia population. People have excessive daytime somnolence. They can have uh, dreamlike hallucinations any point during the day. They can be suddenly paralyzed as if they're asleep, uh, and they can suddenly lose muscle tone uh, called cataplexy. Um, we also now know that that not only do they have problems with falling asleep during the day, but they have difficulty falling asleep at night. Next slide, please. We know that narcolepsy now is probably related in most cases to a post-streptococcus infection, this is strep throat, uh, with an autoimmune reaction uh, that knocks out what are called the hypocretin and erexin cells of the hypothalamus. These are the sleep police cells of the hypothalamus. And this is why patients with narcolepsy have uh, such uh, varied sleep issues. We, we diagnose this uh, clinically in the sleep lab, not with an overnight sleep study, but a daytime sleep study called a multiple sleep latency test. Uh, this is a test where you have uh, four naps two hours apart uh, for 20 minutes at a time. If you fall asleep less than eight minutes in each nap, as well as two of those being associated with REM onsets, that's considered diagnostic uh, for, uh, for narcolepsy. And even in sleep labs, uh, 
uh, these can evade diagnosis for, for many, many years um, uh, for, for a number of reasons. Uh, next slide, please. What's interesting is sodium oxybate, which we talked about in fibromyalgia, uh, is actually FDA approved for narcolepsy. And this is a slide I thought uh, was interesting because a lot of the medicines that we use for narcolepsy happen to be very successful in fibromyalgia, sodium oxybate in particular. Also, stimulants and alerting agents such as Ritalin or Provigil can help keep people awake and combat fatigue. So some of the uh, basic treatments that we use for narcolepsy are also very standard treatments for fibromyalgia. Next slide, please. So we, in conclusion, we, we talked about the various uh, sleep disorders that can be seen in fibromyalgia, including insomnia, uh, hypersomnia, sleep apnea, uh, restless legs, narcolepsy. And, and in general, sleep disorders are quite amenable to commercially available testing uh, in sleep labs, as well as a number of treatment approaches which we've gone over. Non-restorative, non-refreshing sleep, uh, an alpha wave uh, intrusion, is a hallmark of fibromyalgia seen in the vast majority of patients and can be identified using more experimental but commercially available techniques and also may respond to experimental approaches like we discussed as well. Next slide, please. In conclusion, uh, it's important important to have a good ritual wind down uh, at night. You can't just kind of get you working until you jump right to bed. You got to relax a little bit. Uh, you need to be able to manage and reduce your stress levels. Uh, if you do have restless leg syndrome, you want to avoid medications that may worsen this, and some of those are frequently prescribed for fibromyalgia. Uh, our threshold for ordering sleep studies is, is lower than it's ever been. Looking for sleep apnea, periodic leg movements, and alpha intrusions, and you want to consider a logical medical medication regimen uh, for sleep if that is indicated. And I think that is all we have uh, for today. Dr. Rosenfeld? Yes. Can, I'm going to uh, put the questions on the screen now.